Monish Pabrai, often known as the Indian Warren Buffett, has achieved an annual average return of 25.7% over the past 18 years. The way he invests, according to Forbes, is he has no interest in a company that looks 10% undervalued. He is angling to make five times his money in a few years. If he doesn't think the opportunity is blindingly obvious, he passes. Now, this strategy works. Between 2000 and 2018, the assets that he's invested has gone up over 900%, resulting in him managing more than $600 million. So how did he do it? How did he dominate most investors who were struggling to get a 10% annual return, yet alone a 25% one? In this video, I'm going to show you a couple of principles that Parai sticks to in order to achieve these results. Now, keep in mind that if you follow these, you are not guaranteed to get the same return as him, but they are likely to help improve your investing so that you can hopefully get better results. The simplest way to find bargains is to be a cloner. Um, and I am what you would call a shameless cloner. And then in the US, we have 13 F filings where every quarter people have to file what they own. So just figure out who the smart people are, look at what they're buying, reverse engineer them. You don't need an analyst. It's actually fun. This is a very smart and obvious strategy from Manish, but so few people do this because Every quarter, most well-known investors are legally required to show what stocks they've invested in through something called a 13F filing. So Monisha's strategy is to find an investor that has got high returns in the past and one that he trusts and then simply copy their investments. How do you do it? It's very simple in the modern day with the internet. Type in on Google Datarama go on to the super investors category and there you go easy here you have some of the highest achieving investors who legally have to disclose what they own so we can just go on to someone like bill gates here's his main holdings and over here are the stocks that he's bought recently if you like bill gates as an investor take the stocks that he's bought analyze it yourself and then decide if it's worth investing in. Say it's a moat, and they'd break it down to one, one word. But basically, it's the ability of a business uh, to have some type, of an, some type of an enduring competitive advantage that allows it to earn a better than average rate of return over an extended period of time. Uh, and uh, so some businesses have narrow moats, some have broad moats, some have moats that are deep but get filled up pretty quickly. Uh, so what you want is a business that has a deep moat with lots of piranha in it and that's getting deeper by the day. A moat, as I'm sure most of you know, is the water surrounding a castle obviously used as protection. Now, for investing, the moat is used as an analogy for a business that has a strong competitive edge. Even if more competitors come and try and take a piece of their business, the moat is so big, it has so many piranhas in it, that it's too hard for competitors to attack what they've created. For example, Facebook. It's not easy for a competitor to come in and replicate Facebook because their user base is so strong. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups or Ben and Jerry, very hard to replicate because consumers love their products so much. So when you buy a stock, make sure that it has a strong moat. So uh, summing up in terms of what, uh, what do you think do you bring to value investing that others perhaps don't that give you a unique edge? Uh, I think the biggest edge would be attitude. Uh, so, you know, Charlie Munger likes to say that you don't make money when you buy stocks and you don't make money when you sell stocks. You make money by waiting. 
And uh, so the biggest, uh, the single biggest advantage a value investor has is not IQ, it's patience and waiting, waiting for the right pitch and waiting for many years for the right pitch. So what's that saying of Pascal that uh, you like about uh, just sitting in the Yeah, room? all man's miseries stem from his inability to sit in a room alone and do nothing. And all I'd like to do to adapt Pascal is all investment managers' miseries stem from their inability to sit alone in a room and do nothing. You also don't engage in things like short selling. You know, why would you want to take a bet, Steve, where your maximum upside is a double and your maximum downside is bankruptcy? It never made any sense to me, so why go there? That's right. I mean, I think, I think the low risk, high uncertainty is really something I borrowed from uh, entrepreneurs and uh, you know the Patels in India or the Richard Bransons of the world. Uh, basically, if, if you study entrepreneurs, there is a misnomer. People think that entrepreneurs take risk uh, and they get rewarded because they take risk. In reality, entrepreneurs do everything they can to minimize risk. Uh, they are not interested in taking risk. Uh, they want free lunches and they go after free lunches. And so if you study uh, any number of entrepreneurs from Ray Kroc to uh, you know, Herb Schultz at Starbucks and uh, to uh, even, even Buffett and Munger and so on, what you'll find is that they've repeatedly made bets which are low risk bets which have high return possibilities. So they're not going high risk, high return. They're going low risk, high return. When I'm looking at an investment, I now look at it like the way I looked at my first business, which is the first thing I'm looking at is how can I lose money on this? And can I absolutely minimize my downside? Uh, the upsides will take care of themselves. It's the downsides that one needs to worry about, which is why even the checklist becomes important. But uh, so the, the important thing that value investors focus on is downside protection. And that's exactly what entrepreneurs focus on, is what is my downside? So that is the, I would say, the, cross, uh, the crossover between entrepreneurship and investing, and value investing especially, is protect your downside. Yeah, so the checklist I have currently has about 80 items on it. And even though 80 sounds a lot, like a lot, it doesn't take a long time. It takes about 30 minutes to go through the checklist. What I do is when I'm studying a business, I go through my normal process of analyzing the business. When I'm fully done and I'm ready to pull the trigger, that's when I take the business to the checklist. And I run it against the 80 items. But what happens the first time when I run it is there might be seven or eight questions that I don't know the answer to, uh, which is great, which what that means is listen, dummy, go find out the answer to the eight questions first. So which means I have more work to do. So I go off again to find those answers. When I have those answers, I come back and run the checklist again. And any business that I look at is going to have some items on which the checklist raises red flags. But the, the good news is that you're looking in front of you with all, the, uh, with all your facilities at the range of things that could possibly cause a problem. And when you look at that list, you can also compare it to how those factors correlate with the rest of your portfolio. And at that point, uh, kind of you have a go, no go point where you can say, I'm comfortable with these risk factors here. I com I'm com comfortable with the prior probabilities and I'll go ahead with it. Can you give a couple of the things that uh, are on your 80 items? Oh yeah, sure. There's a the, the checklist was created looking at my mistakes and other investors' mistakes. So for example, uh, there's questions like, you know, can this business uh, be decimated by low cost uh, competition from China or other low cost countries? That's a checklist question. Another question is, is this a win-win business for the entire ecosystem? So for example, uh, if there's some company doing, uh, uh, you know, high interest credit cards and they make a lot of money. 
uh, that's not exactly you know helping society. Uh, so you might pass on that, or it's a liquor, liquor company or tobacco company, you know, those can be great businesses, but in my book I would just pass on those, uh, or a gambling business and so on. So, uh, so the checklist uh, will kind of focus you more towards being, playing center court rather than going to the edge of the court. Uh, and uh, there's a whole set of questions on leverage. Uh, for example, you know, how much leverage, what are the covenants, is it recourse or non-recourse? Um, there's a whole bunch of questions on management, on management comp, on the interests of management, on, you know, just a whole, on their historical track records and so on. So um, there's a number, there's a question on unions, uh, on collective bargaining. So, so you know, uh, and, and all of these questions were not questions I created out of the blue. What I did is I looked at businesses where people had lost money. I looked at Dexter Shoes, where Warren Buffett lost money, and he lost it to low-cost Chinese competition. So that led to the question. And I looked at Court Furniture, which was a Charlie Munger investment. Uh, and that was an investment made at the peak of the dot-com boom, where they were uh, doing a lot of uh, office furniture rentals. And the question was, are you looking at normalized earnings or are you looking at boom earnings? And so that's, that question came from there. So the checklist questions, uh, I think, are very robust because they're based on real world uh, arrows people have taken in the back. Monish actually considers himself a very lazy investor. He calls it a gentleman's activity and that it should come from a place of leisure. Now this is interesting because almost everything taught on investing is about hard work and constantly analysing new stocks and listening to CNBC every day. Monish says no, you don't have to invest that way follow simple principles that have worked throughout history created by some of the greatest investors of all time like Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham and the key is to be patient and just stick to these principles and you can get some very high returns.